Hello everyone, my name is Nicole and I'm one of the librarians with the WHA Virtual Library and I'm here to speak to you today about open access, including both finding open access sources and also publishing open access. This webinar is being recorded and will be available via our YouTube channel in a couple of days and we will also be sharing the slides and the presentation with you by email. If you have any questions at any point, please feel free to put them in the chat, raise your hand, let me know. I'm happy to answer them. There will also be some time at the end for additional questions if anyone has any. With that, let's get started. So what is open access? Uh, open access as a term refers to the free access to information and unrestricted use of electronic resources for everyone. That's the definition provided by UNESCO. So let's break it down a little bit what that means. Uh, first off, free access it seems pretty obvious. Free access without payment or subscription required. It might require registration, but as long as you don't need to pay anything, it's still considered within the banner of open access. But what's rather more significant is the unrestricted use portion. And th the way we often think about that is with regards to the five R's, which are shown in the diagram on the right side of your screen. So the five R's describe different ways in which you can use the electronic resources. Uh, they include retaining it, so you can keep a copy for yourself without payment. Reuse, so you can use it uh, whether for a course or for your own research. Revise, so you can make edits to the material. Remix, being that you can combine it with materials from other sources. And redistribute, so you can then share either the original or your revised or remixed version with others. So the way that that works typically is that the resource must be freely licensed to be considered open access. And how that's often done is with a technique called Creative Commons licensing. Now, we're not going to get into a whole lot of detail around copyright here, but basically what you need to know is Creative Commons is a license. It means that you still hold uh, the copyright of the item that you're sharing, but you can describe in a um, set and standardized way what rights you are allowing others to have when they're using these materials. So for example, right at the top of the diagram here is public domain CC0. There are no restrictions on what you need to do with this. You can do whatever you want with it. You can share it wherever, you can do whatever, no restrictions. But more typically we see at least a BY restriction. What BY means is attribution. In other words, if you're going to be using this thing, great, go ahead, but you have to attribute the original author or publication for this work. As we continue down the diagram here, we get more and more restrictive. So the next uh, usage right we see is SA or share alike. And essentially what that means is that you can reuse or revise or remix or share this thing, but it, whenever you do so, you must do so under an equivalent license. So for example, if I've released uh, a work under the CCBYSA license, and then you want to use that work in some other form, maybe you want to put in your book, maybe you want to put it in a course work, uh, you can do that, but you have to release that new work of yours under a same or equivalent license. Uh, moving further down, we're now putting in an NC or non-commercial restriction. Now, what that's referring to is you can reuse this thing, but you can't make any profit off of it. And then you get to NCSA, same thing, no profit, and also you must share anything under the same or equivalent license. And then once we get below the red line, we're getting to stuff that is still being shared, but is no longer really considered open because it doesn't allow for revising and remixing, and that is the ND restriction. ND here refers to no derivatives. So something with this restriction on it means that you can share it, it's free, you can use it, but you can't make any additions to it. And then down at the bottom is what you might think of as traditional copyright, all rights reserved, you can't do anything with it. So now that we understand a little bit about what open access is and what it means, let's talk about how you might find open access publications. Your first stop can be our library catalog, and you can access that through our library's homepage. There's a big search box for you to search in. And I'll look in a slide about uh, how exactly you can find open access specific materials in our catalog. You can look to specific journals. If you know of an open access journal publication in your area of interest, you can search directly in that journal to see what sort of materials they've published. I've listed a couple of examples here, but there are many, many, many more. Uh, you can also sometimes see what are called hybrid journals. And these are journals that have some 
uh, resources that are published under the traditional copyright model where a subscription is required, but they also have some where there is an open access version of the article available and you don't need to subscribe to the journal to access it. Another source for finding OA publications are OA specific search engines. There are again many more of these, but I've listed some examples including DOAJ, which is the Directory of Open Access Journals, BASE, uh, PaperT, and you can also use more general search engines such as Google Scholar to find uh, open access sources. And we have a handout on our website about Google Scholar specifically that you can refer to for more information about that. Next, we have OA repositories. So a repository is essentially a website or an archive where someone has put a copy of their work. Either the author themselves has done so or the journal has done so on their behalf. Repositories can be disciplinary, which means based on uh, the subject area of the work. For example, PubMed Central is a biomedicine uh, based repository, or they can be institutional, hosted by a particular university or other organization. MSpace is the institutional repository of the University of Manitoba. And typically, in order to be considered open access, uh, institutional repositories do need to be able to be searched by people outside of the institution, but there may be some restrictions on access to some of the materials. And then finally, the final option that we want to talk about regarding finding OA publications are various tools. And these include Unpaywall, the Open Access button, and Caperno. All three of these are browser extensions, but there are other types of tools that can help you to find open access sources or open access versions of a particular source that you might be looking at. So this is just a little look at our library catalog. So if you go to our homepage, which is at the URL listed on the left hand side of your screen, uh, there's the big search box, you would enter your search terms in there. And then on the results screen on the left hand side of the page, you will see a whole bunch of different filters about um, narrowing down your search and one of these filters is availability and specifically the open access checkbox so by checking this box you limit your search to only those materials that are available open access so the ones that the library has not paid for any subscription for but that are available to anyone these are identified in the results list with that uh, nice orange open access unlock icon and once you click through on one of those you'll see some options under the view it section that look like what you see at the bottom of the screen here. So in this particular case, there are three different open access view it options for this resource uh, through Biomed Central, which is a major open access publisher, free medical journals, which is a bucket category that we use for all sorts of different smaller free publishers, and then Sprinter open free. And you can see listed underneath of these that some articles have a 12 month delay or embargo. An embargo is basically it's open access but not right away. So the journal might choose to publish something uh, requiring a you might require a subscription for you to see the most recent publications in that journal, but then later on uh, you'll be able to see more of them. So an example of an open access search is the Directory of Open Access Journals, and I've shown you here a screenshot from that search. Uh, you can search either for full journals or for particular articles. And you can narrow down your search again using the filters on the left hand side of the screen. In this particular case, you've got subject, you've got journal title, a DOAJ seal, which is essentially a quality control mechanism used by DOAJ to mark uh, journals that have met particular certification requirements that they have in place. And we'll talk a little bit more later about uh, assessing the quality of open access journals. Uh, you can also filter by journal license. For example, if you want specifically something that you can use commercially, maybe you're publishing a book, you want to include something in there, you would use that. And then finally, your publication. And then on the right hand side there, you see the various search results for a particular search. In this case, I searched for diabetes and I've gotten 79,000 articles. So you can see there's a fairly con considerable body of literature that is available through this source. Next option is the open access repository and here I've chosen to highlight uh, PubMed Central. Now this interface might look a little bit familiar to you if you were familiar with the old PubMed. It's the same interface and indeed PubMed Central articles are generally indexed in full PubMed. So if you search PubMed, you'll be able to find them through there and use their search interface for that. But here you can see other things like article attributes. So whether there's associated data, uh, whether it's been retracted, these things can be super useful if you're looking for a particular type of article. And then just as in old PubMed, just by clicking on the article title, you'd be able to access the full text of the article. 
Finally, I wanted to highlight an OA2 called Unpaywall. So Unpaywall is a browser extension. What that means is you put it on the browser or the, uh, the program that you're using to browse the internet. And then whenever you come across a paywall source, a little icon that will pop up on the right-hand side here, you can see this uh, green lock icon. This means that this article is free. So you've just clicked through that icon, you can access the full text of the article, uh, whether it's in an open access repository or some other source. But also, uh, you might see Unpaywell actually in our library catalog because we've now incorporated it into our library system. So in some of the view it sections of the library catalog, you might see open access full text available at Unpaywell. And clicking through that will also get you the full text of the article through Unpaywell. And there are many other tools and repositories that I haven't chosen to show you here. If you are looking for something specific or you need help, please feel free to reach out to us at any point and we'll be happy to assist you. I want to take a little moment here to talk a little bit about evaluating open access sources. Uh, there is a misconception out there that open access means poor quality. And there are definitely art, uh, journals are out there that are poor quality, both open access and full subscription. But it's important for you to critically evaluate all sources before considering whether you're going to use them or not. And we did a webinar a while ago about evaluating, uh, critically assessing articles. I would definitely recommend you review that if you need more information about how to approach that. And we also did a webinar specifically on predatory publishers. These are journals with unethical or questionable publishing practices. You might be familiar with these from getting spam from them in your email inbox a lot. Um, basically, they are journals that are taking advantage of some of the open uh, ethos to try to scam authors into publishing with them. So some resources for evaluation that I just want to highlight here. Uh, we have the Open Access Journal Quality Indicators. This is essentially a checklist that allows you to quickly assess the quality of an open access source, including whether it's indexed in DOAJ, whether it has that DOAJ seal that I was mentioning earlier. Uh, whether it's available under a certain license, whether there are any of these questionable publishing practices that we might want to identify. There is also the Think, Check, Submit checklist. This one's more focused on open access publishing. So if you were going to go publish in an open access journal, you might use this in order to evaluate whether it's a good journal to publish in or whether it's one of these predatory publishers. Uh, but again, it can be very useful in assessing the quality of a source. So keep in mind, whenever you're looking at a source, whether it's open access or not, there are good journals out there and there are poor quality journals out there. So you always wanna be attentive to critically assessing a source whenever you're going to use it. Uh, I'm gonna pause there and see if there are any questions regarding finding open access sources. I recognize that a couple people might have come in a bit after the start. So if you have any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat box or uh, raise your hand. Seeing none, please feel free to type them in at any time, but I'm going to move on now to talking about publishing in open access sources. So I think it's pretty obvious to most people why open access is a good thing for readers because they get instant access, they don't have to subscribe, they don't have to pay, they can read the article. However, it's not always clear to people why someone might want to publish in an open access journal. And I've summarized here in this diagram a few different reasons for that. First off, there's more exposure for your work. You get higher citation rates, you get people reading your article, you get people engaging with it. Uh, there's a lot of benefit to that in terms of citation rates, in terms of reuse of your sources, which can be really valuable for uh, you career-wise. Our studies have shown that open access articles have a significantly higher citation rate than one equivalent ones in a closed access journal, which can be really useful. The public can access your findings. Taxpayers get value for money, so if you're working uh, for a government organization doing research in that capacity. There's a, a value coming back to the taxpayer from that money, from that work that you're doing. Researchers in developing countries can then get access to your work without needing to uh, subscribe to a journal, which can be really valuable in terms of moving the science forward, making sure that people can build upon each other's discoveries. And I want to explore a little bit the compliant with grant rules part, portion of this. So a lot of funders nowadays are actually putting in requirements that works 
funded through a grant be available through open access sources. Specifically, the TRI agency, which includes CIHR, a major Canadian um, health research funding organization, requires that grant recipients uh, ensure that any peer-reviewed journal publications arising from agency-supported research are freely accessible within 12 months of publication. And that within 12 months of publication bit refers to the embargoes that I was talking about earlier, so it would still be access access acceptable here for a, you to publish in a journal that, say, has an embargo up to a year long, and still that work would be considered open access. And I want to highlight here Sherpa Juliet, which is a free website which you can use to quickly look up uh, the funder requirements around open access. It summarizes them for a wide variety of different granting agencies. But of course, if it doesn't list yours or you have any questions about that, please feel free to reach out to your granting agency for more information about their requirements. So in talking about publishing open access, you might hear something about gold versus green open access. So gold is what a lot of people first think of when they think of open access publishing. Essentially, the article is published in a journal and you can read it for free. That's sort of the traditional model. It's published in a journal that's either fully open access or one of those hybrid journals I was mentioning earlier where some of the articles are free to access and some of them are not. Uh, the final published work is free for anyone to read. There may be charges to the author associated with this though, and those are called APCs or article publishing charges. Uh, these can range from anywhere from zero at some journals to thousands of dollars. Those are paid by the author in order to publish in these journals. Um, so that's something to keep in mind if you're intending to publish something open access, you wanna make sure that either you've worked into your grant funding for an APC, or you've located a journal where there are no APCs uh, applicable. Green open access, on the other hand, refers to those repositories that I was mentioning earlier. So those include things like PubMed Central, MSpace, other repositories where the author has self-archived a copy of their journal. Uh, sometimes there can be an embargo period, depends on the requirements of the publisher, but there are no publishing expenses associated with that generally for the author. So if you don't have funding available to cover those article uh, charges, you can go with the green OA option, there's no fee associated with it. So in terms of choosing a venue for gold open access publication, so this is a journal that is either fully open access or um, has a hybrid option where you can choose to publish an article open access in that journal. You can look at uh, existing open access journals in your field if you're aware of them, but I also wanted to flag this particular resource for you. So this is a, a journal selector called Cofactor. It allows you to search for a particular journal publication venue for your article based on a number of factors, one of which is uh, its open access components. So you can search for a journal based on whether it has any open access options, uh, whether it's fully open access or hybrid, what, what license you want it to be other, whether it's that CCBY I was talking about earlier where only an attribution is required, whether there's an NC requirement or non-commercial or anything else. And um, you don't see it here on this screen, but further down on the selection option, you can actually choose a maximum APC that you'd be able to pay. So you can select for journals that only have a small APC if you don't have a lot of funding available. So this tools is really useful to help you identify potential publication venues. If you aren't familiar with uh, either journal articles in general, journal venues in general in your field, or whether you're not aware of specifically open access journals in your field, uh, this tool can help you to identify them. So then we turn to the green open access option or the self-archiving option. So there's a tool out there called Sherpa Romeo, which details the restrictions on archiving available through each particular publisher. So if you publish in a journal hosted by Springer, for example, they might have different requirements for what you're allowed to do in terms of archiving compared to a journal from Elsevier. And just this diagram on the right-hand side of the screen here details some of the terms you might come across when thinking about archiving different versions of your article. So there's the preprint, which is essentially the version that you submit to the journal before it's gone through any sort of peer review or any sort of copy editing or formatting. The preprint is like your version of it. Then after it goes through peer review and you do whatever corrections are necessary, you have the postprint, also called the author accepted manuscript. 
So most often journals are okay with you submitting a preprint to an archive. They may or may not be okay with you submitting a postprint and there may be an embargo requirement. But then when you get to the published or version of record, often there are restrictions on where you can share that version if you can at all. So in terms of self-archiving options for you, as mentioned earlier, there are institutional repositories, which are hosted by a particular organization, and there are also disciplinary repositories, which are based on your subject area. So an example of an institutional repository is mSpace, which is hosted by the University of Manitoba. But what's particularly interesting about mSpace is it is a what's called an adoptive repository. And what that means is if you are a researcher anywhere in Manitoba, even if you're not affiliated with the University of Manitoba, you can still submit your work to mSpace. There are um, obviously institutional repositories at other organizations, and if you're working with someone who has an institutional affiliation where they have a repository, you can choose that as an option. But adoptive repositories allow you to submit something even if your particular institution or organization doesn't have one. So that can be really useful if you're trying to fulfill a funding requirement when you're at a place that doesn't have an institutional repository. Then you also have the option of disciplinary repositories. And just to mention a few examples of those here, uh, Sigma is a, a, sorry, a disciplinary repository specifically focused on nursing research, whereas Metarchive is a preprint specific repository, so only the author submitted version can be deposited here, but it's more broad, it's focused on biomedicine in general. It's come to attention a lot lately. You might have heard of it because of the whole COVID-19 situation. They have an extensive collection of preprints related to COVID-19 research. Uh, the final example I want to mention here in terms of disciplinary repository is CogPrints, which is focused on cognitive science, psychology, that sort of thing. But there are definitely many more options out there. And if you're looking for a particular uh, subject area or you're interested in other publishing options, please feel free to reach out to us and we'll be happy to help set you up with that. So that brings us to the end of the presentation. Uh, that was a very quick overview, but we will be sharing the recording and the slides with you after the fact. And if anyone has any questions that they'd like to bring forward at this point, please feel free to do so. The chat window is open to you and I'm here and happy to well, answer any questions that you might have. I'm just going to mute myself for a little while while we see if anyone has any questions. All right, so I'm not seeing any questions at this point. Uh, please feel free to email me. My email is up on the screen here if you do have any questions or you want more information about anything that we've spoken about today. And again, the presentation has been recorded. It will be posted on our YouTube channel within a couple of days, and we will also be sharing the slides by email. Uh, thank you very much for attending this presentation. I hope it was useful to you, and I hope to hear from you soon. Bye-bye.